Well, good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? Well. Turning a club into a church. <laughs> this is wonderful opportunity. We should do this on a Friday night. Come into the club. Music. Praise Jesus! I know some of you guys are not you, Presbyterians in the room. I apologize if I offended anybody already. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I grew up Baptist and I got into Pentecostal and I went to a Presbyterian church. I'm all confused, but I love Jesus, that's for sure. Uh, th that was my best joke. If you didn't find that funny, it's going to be a long speech, okay? Well, let, let me just uh, give a little bit about my background. And before I do so, say Dr. Whitaker, Anderson University, God bless you. God bless Anderson University. What a wonderful university sharing the love of Jesus throughout South Carolina and, frankly, the nation. I grew up in North Charleston. I grew up in a single-parent household. My, my parents got divorced at seven years old. Uh, one of the most uh, important, impactful moments in my life. From seven to 14, I drifted. How many of y'all realize that all drifting heads in the wrong direction? I drifted, and at 14 years old, I'm a freshman in high school, and I'm flunking out. As a matter of fact, I successfully flunked out of high school as a freshman. I failed Spanish, English, world geography, and I'm the first United States senator to fail civics, <laughs> the study of politics. Now, I must, I must concede that after years in the Senate, I realized that I may not be the only United States Senator <laughs> to fail civics. I, I just have the grades to prove it. I will say, however, that when you fail Spanish and English, no one calls you bilingual. They all call you by ignorant, because you can't speak in any language. That's where I found my unhappy self. But I had two amazing blessings. I had a powerful praying mama, and I met a mentor my sophomore year who changed the trajectory of my life. And when I was flunking out of high school, my, my mother would, she would work seven to three as a nurse's aide, so she's turning patients, changing bedpans. It's not a glamorous job. And then she would go back to the same job from 3.30 to 11, because she was doing everything in her power to keep us off of welfare, to give me an example of someone who worked every day, because there's dignity in all work. And I remember one night when she came home about 11.30, quarter to 12, and she looked at my report card, she looked at me, she looked at my report card, and she got me out of bed, and she said to me with passion, Son, I'm praying for you. I believe if you shoot for the moon and you miss, you'll be among the stars. But today, I got to remind you, I brought you in this world, <laughs> and I can take you out. And she introduced me to a new form of encouragement. <laughs> it is called a switch. Now, for those of you not from the South, a switch is a southern apparatus of encouragement <laughs> applied from your belt to your ankles. And after I was thoroughly convinced she was serious, I went to summer school, caught up with my class, and graduated on time. I graduated, thank God, with a small scholarship football to Presbyterian College. And it was at PC where on September the 22nd, 1983, that a guy named John Rickenbacker had an altar call after a Bible study, and my life was transformed. I was reconciled with my Heavenly Father. And I will tell you that had it not been for PC, uh, Christian education, I would not be where I am today. And let me say to every president, administrator, faculty member, let me say to the body of believers at work, 
on Christian campuses, what you do is changing and has changed this country. In so many ways, we look around and we can be discouraged. Because it seems like we're living in a post-Christian society. And in many ways, we are. But the foundation of hope is oftentimes around the world found on Christian campuses where kids like me, lost as a goose in a rainstorm, finds hope, finds an opportunity for a life to be restored. And if in our polarized nation, we are going to find ways to recover and restore and reconcile. I believe that the foundation of hope is found on Christian campuses. That's a good time to say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Even in church or in a club, you can say amen. This is a good experience for the club. May it saturate into the woods of the floor and into the walls and into the ceiling and any, that too. <laughs> Lord bless them all indeed and get them all saved in him. Anyways, my mother actually wanted a pastor. She got a politician, so let's pray for my mother. <laughs> In the United States Senate, uh, I have been working with a guy named James Langford, who is a former youth pastor, who also is a product of Christian education. And James and I were talking one day in the Senate about how do we bring this polarized nation back together? What is it that's missing that could help us understand each other? And James said to me, how many times do you have folks that come into your house and have a meal and they don't look like you? That was an interesting question. I'm not going to ask you guys the same question, but pretend that I did. How many of us break bread, not in a restaurant, but at home with someone who is of a different color than yourself. So James and I came up with this idea, and the definition of James and I means I want half the credit, though he had 90% of the idea. So in politics, you know, you want to split everything when it's good, and you want to walk away with, from it when it's bad. So in this case, thank you very much. Let me just talk to these people right here on the front row, right, right here. Get as close as I can without falling on the stage. So James came up with this great concept, and he allowed me to be a part of, of Solutions Sunday. So often we say that the most segregated hour on Sunday is at 11 a.m. because we go to different places to worship. And James said, why not have a Solution Sunday after that church service? Let's spend some time together. But not out there somewhere, but in your place, in your home breaking bread so that we can get to know each other just a little bit better. Because I believe that it's not the White House that we should be concerned with. It's our house. Because restoration and reconciliation is going to happen one relationship at a time. Now, it's always helpful to have people in leadership talk in a way that is consistent with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But save that... It's up to us. Amen. Amen. Thank y'all very much for starting us off with there. See, I think I'm funny sometimes, to be honest with you. I know I'm not always, but it is okay to laugh even if you don't think it's funny. I'm speaking to y'all right here, by the way. It just I don't want you to wonder who I'm talking about. You know what I'm saying? I'm going back to South Carolina after this, so I'm talking to y'all. Coming back to y'all too in a minute now, but I'm talking to y'all right here, right now. The truth of the matter is that when we find ourselves doing the uncomfortable now, it gets comfortable later. It is so important for us to get this right now. And I'll tell you why. One of my best friends in Congress, really my best friend in Congress, is a guy named Trey Gowdy who went to a Christian school as well. His roommate, anybody in here know Ed Young Sr., pastor somewhere in Texas? Trey's roommate was, in fact, Ed's youngest son, I believe it was. And Trey and I have dinner 
three times a week when we're in Washington. Uh, and it's, it's so good to be in a place where you can have uh, a dinner or a lunch with someone who believes as you believe. That, that, that Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so one man does the other, trades that guy for me. And I know he's just announced his retirement, so I'm sad and depressed, but the reality of it is that for the last almost eight years, Trey and I have grown closer and closer and closer. And as we think about this path to reconciliation, it, it didn't happen for us in the group of yeah, 63 new folks coming into the house in 2010, we were classmates. It didn't happen during the middle of a, of, a, of a Congress or a conference in Congress. It happened breaking bread night after night after night. I didn't know what God was doing. But on June the 17th, Wednesday, 2015, Trey and I were leaving our normal dinners. I went back to my office, which is also known as my bedroom, got my, computer, my laptop out and started working 10 o'clock at night, 10.30, was still working, and I get this phone call from home. And it's the sheriff's office. And they tell me there's been a church shooting. And I say to myself, uh, a church shoot? So I pray, and he calls me back, and he tells me that it's my friend, Clemente Pinckney's church, where there's been a shooting. And so I text Clemente, and I say, Clemente, are you and your members Okay. No response. So I call Trey Gowdy and I tell Trey that there's been a church shooting. And I'm not getting a response. And then I get the response and, and learn. that they're gone. And I wonder, how do we recover? How do we move forward? And Trey, in an amazing way, shows up and walks step by step, by step. Through the greatest tragedy, mass murder in South Carolina's history. How do you get to a place where a white guy raised by a doctor in deep conservative Spartanburg, South Carolina, becomes the first person, a black guy, from a single parent household, turns to, in the middle of such an atrocity, whose objective was to create a race war. It didn't happen because we were in Congress together. It happened because we were able to, for five years before the shooting, break bread together, disagree on some really important issues, to be irritated <laughs> with one another but to love each other with a gospel love. 
And so many people ask, why did not Charleston, the place of the first shot of the Civil War, not erupt in riots? Dylan Roof wanted to start a race war. It's why he went to Mother Emanuel Church. It's why he chose a church that has birthed churches throughout this nation. It's why he targeted Charleston was to erupt a race war. How did all that not happen? Well, when you read the biographies of the nine who were slain, Christian education is a major part of it. Clemente Pinckney, state senator, pastor, went to Allen University, a Christian school. And 36 hours after the shooting, nine families showed up at court looked into a camera, looked into the eyes of the killer and said, we forgive you. If you will reconcile yourself with God, you can spend eternity with Jesus. It, it, it didn't Eliminate the pain, the horror, the misery. It didn't restore the lost lives. But what it did was it sent a signal around the world and specifically at home that love is more powerful than hate. That the truth of the gospel, Matthew 5, 44, to love your enemies, to pray for those who would persecute you and take you out, that the gospel of Jesus Christ is so real that even within the span of just 36 hours, we are willing to lay our pain and suffering at the cross. You see, I have this picture in my head of what happened before they walked into the courtroom. I have this picture in my head of, of, of families gathered together Kneeling, praying for the strength to do what the gospel instructs all of us to do. And then they stood up and they did it. Here's my prayer for each and every one of you. That as you return to your campuses, realize that the culture on your campuses that is conducive for kids like me and Trey and James Langford and families like Clemente's and Mr. Daniel Simmons Sr., who's been so saturated with the love of God on a campus, who enters this world to work in whatever field called finds themselves able to do the impossible in part because of what they get on your campuses. Be encouraged that the source of life that this nation desperately needs, the source of life that this world is hungry for, has at least in part changed my city changed my state, changed my nation. But it started 
perhaps as a mustard seed because at first changed me.